What are the rites, rituals, and philosophy of Freemasonry? What is the consistent teaching of the church regarding it? Can Catholics and other Christians seek membership in the Lodge? Is Freemasonry compatible with sacred scripture and church teaching? Here to answer these questions for us and many others is our guest, John Salza. He is an attorney, apologist, radio talk show host, and author of several books, including Masonry Unmasked. An insider reveals the secrets of the Lodge. Let's welcome John Salza. John, welcome to The Abundant Life today. Thank you, Jenna. Good to be here. Delighted to have you here and truly a topic that I have been wanting to discuss for about 10 years now, an incredibly long time. And uh, I think you're the man and you're the one who is going to help us uh, come to a deeper understanding of what Freemasonry is truly all about and why it is not compatible with church teaching. Before we get into that, share with me a little bit about how you became involved in the Lodge, seeing that you are a lifelong Catholic. I'm a lifelong cradle Catholic. I had 12 years of Catholic education. Jeanette, I really grew up having a strong relationship with God. I never had any theological objections to the church. Yet, when I graduated from law school, I was solicited to join Freemasonry, believe it or not, by many Catholic men whom I looked up to, I admired, I grew up with some of these men. And I had a vague recollection that maybe the church was not okay with this. But during the solicitation process, they all claimed that the church had once opposed European Freemasonry. It has nothing to do with what's going on in, in U.S. lodges, and in any event, you can be a Mason. And I said, well, I believe these guys. I trusted them. I didn't feel really a need to investigate it further, but I did call my parish priest just to make sure. And he, too, said, well, I haven't really studied the matter, John, but it was his understanding that it would be permissible for me to join. And so I got involved purely um, based on uh, business opportunities. And it was presented to me as a young lawyer that this would be an opportunity for you to network, to have a greater network of, of business contacts. And so that was the pretext on which I, I joined the Lodge. Not an unusual one. Not at all. I mean, that's, uh, that's why many men join it, for camaraderie, for social, and, and for business reasons. And I must confess, when I was initiated in, into Freemasonry, I had quite a few spiritual misgivings, and I'll just explain a few of these. And this is what all men go through when they go to the Lodge. After you're accepted and there's a unanimous ballot that's taken, you're accepted into the Lodge, you receive uh, your first three degrees, and the first degree is called the Entered Apprentice Degree. And so a man goes to the Lodge, and he's taken to the back room, and he's re required to strip down. All his clothes are off except his, his undergarments, his underwear. And I thought to myself, this is kind of odd, but this appears to be a fraternity, and that's what fraternities do. So I said, fine, I'll go along with it. But then they asked me to do something else, John. They told me to take off my wedding ring, my crucifix, and my scapular. My and I thought to myself, wait a minute. Now, this is an organization that purports to want to help a man be better in his own faith, and yet they're now asking me on the night of my initiation to remove all reminders of my faith, and that's completely incompatible with what they profess masonry to be. They said, don't worry about it. It's all going to be explained to you when you get in the lodge room. And as you can imagine, there's peer pressure here. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're hit over the head with this requirement. You have family and friends waiting for you to come out in the lodge room. And so candidates invariably proceed. And, and not, not to mention that you're in a very vulnerable position. I mean, you're you, you almost are. stark naked. You are, and uh, I felt terrible about it. Uh, those are the only three times my wedding ring has ever been off, you know, the first three degrees of masonry. And after that, they blindfold you. So here you are in a state of vulnerability, ready to receive the truths of Freemasonry. And so, and again, this is what all candidates in the United States and throughout the world go through. And so they escort you to the lodge and they require you to, to knock on the door three times. And then your conductor says, you know, Mr. John Salza, who has long been in darkness and now seeks to be brought to light. Hmm. And again, here I am reflecting on this as a Catholic. I've only been blindfolded a couple minutes, but this gentleman's claiming that I've long been in darkness. I'm not sure what he means by that. Well, when you go on to read what Freemasonry teaches about that, it's teaching you that you are in a state of spiritual and mystical ignorance until you receive the light of the lodge. Hmm. And so even though I was baptized in the light of Jesus Christ and I'm not no longer in the kingdom of darkness, Freemasonry looked upon me as a baptized Catholic to be in a state of darkness. 
it sounds very Gnostic in its orientation here. You know, Gnostic uh, Gnosticism is one of those uh, uh, heresies of the church that uh, says that through some esoteric wisdom and knowledge, we come to a state of enlightenment, that we are all ignorant until we recognize this state of enlightenment in Gnosticism. It's typically our own divinity. And it just reminds me of that as you're speaking here. It does. Uh, in fact, Freemasonry claims that as an initiate into Freemasonry, you hold wisdom and knowledge that the outside world doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Masons referred to non-Masons as profanes. Mm -hmm. And so, as a Catholic, I was required by the Lodge to look at my Catholic brothers who were not Masons as outsiders, as profanes. And it really drives a wedge between even you and your spouse. Here I am, I was divested of all my religious and sacramentals uh, reminders. And the, you know you're required to swear oaths of secrecy under these grisly symbolic penalties of torture and death, never to reveal it. So these are things you can't even share with your spouse. Mm -hmm. And so there's an immediate uh, a division that occurs. They want to separate you from the profane world once you enter into the, the secrets of masonry. So there you are, John, and you know you you're you're in your undergarments and you've been stripped of your wedding ring and your scapular and. You're, you're standing there and you're blindfolded and you hear these words, you know, that you've been in darkness and now you're about to come into the light. What happens next? They escort you into the lodge room and they press a very sharp instrument into your chest. And they say, if you ever reveal the secrets of Freemasonry, you know, you're worthy of the death penalty. This should be the pain and torture your conscience should feel if you ever violate uh, the secrets of Masonry. So they set the tone right away that this is a secret organization. It's a secret ritual. You can never reveal it. Hmm. Then they escort you into the lodge. And the worshipful master, who is the head principal officer of the lodge, asks you to make a confession of faith in deity. This is the only requirement for you to be a Mason. A man must believe in God, must make a profession of faith in deity. doesn't matter what God he believes in. And so uh, the worshipful master puts his left hand on the candidate's head and says, in whom do you put your trust? This is the first test. If you're an atheist, you can't be a Mason. If you make any profession of faith in deity, you're worthy. And so I, of course, professed my belief in Jesus Christ. But if I would have made a profession, let's say, in the Great Thumb, or in Brahma, or Vishnu, or Hiva, whatever it is, the Lodge would have told me, and I quote, your trust being in God, your faith is well founded. Arise, follow your conductor, and fear no danger. So here's Janet, where the Lodge, if this man rejects Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity, Freemasonry lies to that man. It tells that man that he's still okay, his trust is in God, and his faith is well founded. That's where the church comes in and says no. God has definitively, definitively revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. We must accept that revelation in faith. There are no other gods, and yet Freemasonry denies that revealed truth. Uh, it also occurs to me, as you're sharing here, John, that what we have here is um, syncretism. What we have here is an indifferentism. It doesn't matter which god you believe in, as long as you believe in a god. And so, therefore, any path of religious expression is the same as any other path. There is no one right way to go. All paths are equal, and they all lead to whatever this god of Freemasonry who maybe uh, encompasses all of these mm -hmm. gods is all about. Am I right, or am You're I reading too right. much? The, the grand architect of the universe is what Masonry calls God. They give their own unique names for their understanding of God and their own symbols for God. Why do they do that? Because they want to identify their understanding of God as unique. I mean, when you name something in the world, you're declaring that something unique. And indifferentism that you mentioned really is the primary basis upon which the church has condemned the Freemasonry. Because indifferentism believes that all religions are equally valid, they're equally serviceable, they're equally profitable. And it's premised on the notion that God has not definitively revealed himself. Hmm. Therefore, if God hasn't revealed himself, then one can offer God any form of worship. If he's sincere and God will be pleased with it. Of course, this rejects you know, the truths of sacred scripture in our tradition That's that God has definitively revealed himself. It, re it rejects Jesus Christ in whom the fullness of deity resides, as we, re we yeah. read in sacred scripture. So immediately there's this tension because... It can't be both ways. Sacred scripture can't be right and Freemasonry right. You know, one of them's got to be wrong. And so therefore, there's that sense of cognitive dissonance, yes. you know, like, 
boing, I'm getting two thoughts and they're mm. equally opposing. And what do I do and what do I believe here? And a man may you know, take the position, well, I believe in, in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and so I'm okay. It's not what you believe. It's what the lodge believes. You know, you didn't write the rituals. It's what the lodge teaches. And so if the lodge is going to declare to a man who rejects Jesus Christ that his faith is still in God and well-founded, that is a lie, and that's what the popes have said. Hmm. And so Freemasonry really has been authored by the father of lies because it rejects our Lord. There's another, I think, troublesome component here to this very first degree, and that is that, you know, this, this uh, sharp object is, is pressed into your chest and basically saying, okay, no, if you reveal this, you know, your penalty is death. And so you've got to make a promise that you're not going to reveal. And now, would we consider that a blood oath? Yeah, the, the uh, thing that you just talked about happens in, at the beginning of the man being escorted into the lodge. Later, though, he's required to take an oath. And in okay. fact, in all Masonic degrees, a man is required to swear oaths of secrecy, binding himself to the teachings of the organization, that he's going to preserve and maintain the secrets of, of what the lodge teaches. Hmm. 